Years later, it was a very different Margot Kidder who was found disheveled and disoriented in a Los Angeles backyard, deep in the grip of manic depression. Now, thanks to something called orthomolecular medicine, Margot Kidder says she is cured, and she joins us this morning from Billings, Montana. With us from Toronto is Dr. Abram Hoffer, the man that Margot credits with her cure. Good morning to both of you. Good, Good morning. And we're happy to reunite you guys after a little time away from one another. That's great. For how long, what, when was the last time you saw one another, Margot? Uh, a year ago at the last orthomolecular conference. Well, and this time, yeah. this time, uh, Dr. Hoffer, you are receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award. So I, I, why don't you tell, for those of us who don't know, what is orthomolecular medicine and how does it help schizophrenia and, and, and manic depression? Well, basically, if we pay proper attention to nutrition, to the use of the right vitamins and minerals. We sometimes use drugs as well, but we get them much less important than we do to the natural products. So the main thing is to get the right quantities of the B vitamins and lots of vitamin C, make sure that people don't tank up in too much sugar and junk food. And we combine that with the rest of the treatment and the results are really very good. Well, I wanted to ask you, yeah, what sort of success rate do you have, Dr. Hoffer? Well, with the kind of schizophrenic patient who's been sick less than two years, and assuming that they're going to cooperate with the treatment, <clears throat> I expect about a 90% recovery rate. And I can tell you what I mean by recovery. It means that they're paying income tax. Interesting. And that's something that's very rare if you have to depend only on drugs. If Margie Kidder had depended on drugs only, she wouldn't be talking to us here today, would you, Margie? No, I certainly wouldn't. In fact, I was, what you're told in the conventional psychiatric world is that you'll never get better and you have to take these drugs in order to manage your symptoms as opposed to cure yourself of your symptoms. And so you end up on this hamster wheel of, of drugs and then more drugs to offset the side effects of those drugs. And in the long term, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Hoffer, um, I think you get worse because I think the difference on the system between illegal drugs and le legal drugs is neg negligible, the only difference being one's legal and one's not. And you can destroy your body and your mind with the, uh, with the prescribed drugs. It's not a cure, it's a symptom managing system, whereas what Dr. Hoffer does makes you well. How are you feeling these days, Margo? I'm feeling wonderful. I'm feeling very, very well, yeah. And how, yeah. Did you, how did you meet up with Dr. Hoffer? How did you hear about this man and his method? Well, I was, uh, I heard about it the way many people do, and I think it's a great tragedy, which was when I was desperate after that big public flip out. Um, even in the midst of that, I knew that the that this, this cycle of going to shrinks, getting more drugs, fl going off the drugs, flipping out was not working. At that time in 96, did you know how ill you were? I mean, I know that you, you attempted suicide, what, when you were 14 years old? This is something that you've oh, lived I with. I attempted suicide several times, yeah. yeah. I just always assumed I'd never get to be this old. I'm a grandmother now. Um, I assumed that I would have killed myself by this stage in my life. Wow. And so um, I feel really lucky, but I think the tragedy is that so many of us come to this very logical uh, way of getting well as a last resource, as a, at a point of desperation in our lives when we've tried everything else. And in fact, if, if our conventional psychiatrists really thought about it, it's only sensible to first address the body mm -hmm. and acknowledge that the mind is an organ of the body and we're not cut off at the neck and to address what physical stuff is going on and fix that. And, you know, the Greeks knew a healthy body, healthy mind, and as does Dr. Hoffer. And when you take out the toxins and put in the nutrients that are lacking, I think there are very few people who don't get well. Dr. Hoffer, have I you... I could be wrong. Have you, met, have you met with many cynics? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there are critics to your method, and what, what has your response been to them? Because it sounds well, unconventional to me. The natural response to anything new in medicine is, of course, a major skepticism. And I had to face this for over many years. We did our first controlled studies beginning in 1952. We did everything right, and our work should have been accepted gracefully. It was not. However, the big issue was not, was I going to please my colleagues? Was I going to please the medical profession? My objective was to get my patients well. Yeah. And that was much more important to me than staying within the box and doing everything that I'm supposed to do, even though my patient didn't get well. So orthomolecular medicine is more than just drugs, and we, we do get many more of our patients normal. Uh, Margo, I wanted to ask you... Normal? I, mean, I don't know, Dr. Hoffer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you about... You well... Know, there, there, are so many, there are so many gifted people out there uh, throughout history 
that have suffered from various forms of, of, of mental illness or, or, or psychiatric problems. Mm -hmm. And I know a, a friend of yours, Jennifer Salt, who you lived with in 71, you right. know, when you were hanging out with De Palma and Scorsese and Spielberg and all those guys, she said, you know, it's hard to tell sometimes when the illness ends and the greatness begins. What do you think of that? Well, you know, there, uh, the, when I started studying this and finally began to do my homework, I think there's a reason for that. And uh, to, ex to, to put it in terms of the way somebody who's not studied all these books could understand it, I think what happens when you're manic in particular is your short-term memories lit up and your long-term memories lit up and your visual senses are lit up. And what you get is an awareness simultaneously of all of your realities, yeah. um, if that makes sense. Something you read when you were 10 uh, connects to you with something you're seeing on TV. So you make unusual um, connections and you come up with what are called conceptual ideas. You know, you get a third idea out of them and it is a creative state. Unfortunately, it doesn't last. Well, um, I, I don't want to ask you about, yeah. about, about right, I mean, right now you seem so confident and, and so well, as you said. Uh -huh. um, are you worried about a relapse at all? Does that concern you? Well, I had an interesting thing happen this year, which was that I'd had three dental surgeries. I had a lot of work done in my mouth, which was a nightmare, and a car accident. And um, so I'd had a lot of antibiotics. I'd had anesthesia. I'd had pain pills for the broken pelvis and the, the stuff in my teeth. And I started to get depressed, and I was so shocked because it had been years and years since I'd been depressed. And uh, it was actually a terrific little reminder of how powerful depressive thoughts are and why we tend to think the mind is separate from the body. They're very compelling, these thoughts. And, but I was able to go, something's wrong with your body. Something's wrong with you, kid, or you shouldn't be having these thoughts. And called Dr. Hoffer, actually, because <laughs> I'm very lucky to have these, these people in my life now. And he told me what to take and what to up and got my history, and I felt better very, very quickly. But it was a good little reminder for me of, of, of that mind-body connection, you know, how incredibly profound it is and how persuasive uh, those thoughts are and how they're to be respected in a, in a frightening kind of way. So Mark, it, it, that's the only blip I've had in years and years. Margo, I wanted to ask you, too, uh, you know, back in 1991 when the first Gulf War was on, this is kind of off topic, but I mean, you were known as Baghdad Betty. I mean, yes, you, I was. You, you experienced hostility on the streets because you were against Death that war. Death threats would be definitely hostility, yeah. And now, now, now here we are, you know, hopefully in the closing hours of Gulf War II. What are your thoughts now? I mean, were you against this war? Has it changed when you see the jubilation on the streets of Baghdad? I just wanted your quick thoughts on I was it. against it, and I am against it. I think the loss of life, the loss of civilian life, the children, the mothers, the soldiers, the number of people who have died, the destruction because of this war, there, there was a different way to, to get those objectives, and it was simply keeping the inspectors in and disarming him. I, I, I have no regrets at all about being against it. I think the, the one day of jubilation in the streets, which has turned into anarchy, is not something that should make us change our minds. I think this is just the beginning, and it will be, end up being like the Israelis in the West Bank. I think it's tragic. Let me end this on a happy note. You look fantastic. It's great to see Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hoffer, happy yes. birthday. Thank you. You look fantastic as well. Thank and we, you. And congratulations on your I, award. He <laughs> does indeed.